Good afternoon. This is Sarah with the Department of Medicaid. It's not quite one o'clock, so we'll give it just a moment before we get started. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you. Also, Matt, would it be okay? Uh, Justin Derringer has to leave a little early. Would it be okay to move the community health workers up some on the agenda so he could address that? No, I don't. I don't care a bit at all. Thank you. That's fine. Yep. Um, I have a quick question though before we get started. Um, do we need to elect the chair at the beginning of every year for the for the TAC? Is that something that we have to do? So the MAC bylaws state that the MAC does that. Uh, to mm -hmm. be honest, some of the tax do and some of the tax don't. Um, so if you would like to add that, we can do that at the next agenda. And or if you want to bring that up under new business today, if someone else would like to, uh, you know, can, if you don't want to continue or if you want to. So, um no, I mean, I don't plan on not continuing. <laughs> okay. I, I, I doubt anybody else wants to take that over. I mean, they might. If they do, they can tell me that's fine. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I I don't uh, I don't think it matters to us. I just wanted to, if we needed to, I was going to throw that in today. But if we okay. don't, that's okay. I think it's a permanent position, Matt. <laughs> well, Steve, if we were going to, I was going to nominate you and not tell you. Well, I've, no, already, I've, already, I've already I've already got the votes. Let's don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. It is one o'clock, uh, and everybody it looks like is in from the waiting room. I counted three of the five uh, members. Did I miss anyone that might not be on camera? Okay. You still do have a quorum, so I will turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up. Um, Dr. Burchett here from uh, Richmond, Kentucky, and uh, we've got the quorum established, so let's go ahead and get started. And we'll approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Um, I assume everybody's read those, and do you have any um uh, issues with them, we'll take a motion to approve and go from there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Steve Compton, I move to approve. Good. We have a second. That'd be you, James. Yep. Can you hear me? I can now. <laughs> there you go. I second. Okay. Well, any discussion on them? Everything looked okay to you guys? Yeah, it looked fine. Okay. Well, with no discussion, all in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting, say aye. Aye. Uh, Good. All opposed? Okay. So, in, uh, in help for Justin, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and move down on, under new business and let him talk about, uh, I think it was the community health workers. And I think, Steve, that was something you had that you were wanting to talk with, too. So if we want to go ahead and get started on that topic, we'll do that first. So Sarah and I talk. We just like to have a little more information. Sounds uh, good. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you uh, um, for letting me uh, talk briefly about the community health workers. And I didn't know if you wanted just general information um, or if you wanted a kind of a up to date where we were as of today as far as billing and who's billing and that type of thing. Justin, I think more general information. I don't know that we're all aware of their existence or what they can do for our practice, much less how to incorporate it or bill it or that sort of thing. So, sure, sure. Uh, is there any way, <clears throat> excuse me, is there any way uh, I could um, um, share my screen? Aaron? Yes, sir. I just made you a co host. Okay. All right. Give me just a second here. Let me.
All right. So uh, we'll just go through this real quick then. This is uh, actually not really been updated. Uh, it needs to be updated, but I'll kind of hit some highlights um, with you. And uh, um, it is um, uh, just a few little slides here that um, – um, <clears throat> kind of give you the basic idea of uh, community health workers, what they do, um, and um, how they are uh, utilized and, and so forth. So um, this is uh, community health workers started the first build uh, in starting in January 1st of 2024. Um, we've had some people kind of use them in the past uh, as far as the managed care organizations uh, are, have used community health workers. They were able to hire their own community health workers. We just started being able to, um, uh, you know, bill for uh, let other provider types bill for community health workers uh, starting in uh, January 1st. Uh, and we've been working on this and implementing this for a long time. Uh, we originally started about two years ago doing some research on the use of community health workers, what they were doing in other states, how they were being used, uh, what services that we could utilize them for. And, you know, uh, several intersecting uh, conversations went into place. We had uh, a work group on um, <clears throat> transportation and transportation issues. We had another work group on um, um uh, no shows and, and uh, no show uh, issues. And so uh, one of the, the things that um, uh, can it continuously came up was that uh, other states had those listed at community health worker services listed as something that was uh, kind of uh, assisting with that. So um, this is, uh, again, like I said, it continued to, to uh to come up and uh we were able to um come up with uh, some a program here that i think will be beneficial to all provider types um uh, community health workers uh um provide a lot of services um uh, to be able to qualify as a community health worker uh they have to be a united states citizen employed uh be at least 18 years of old and they have to maintain a certification that certification is uh held by the department for public health there's administrative regulation that they have they have to follow uh that um um administrative regulation and basically uh, the things that are listed right here, they have to abide by, but then they also have to do some education and training. Uh, the, the Department for Public Health puts that training on, holds that certification, and so they can become certified as a, a, a community health worker. Um, well, the things that they're able to do are preventive services, health promotion, education. They can facilitate provider communication, patient education, other services, and and so forth. And I, I left this out of presentation mode because I wanted you all to see some of the notes underneath, um, you know, that associate with that. There's directive uh, preventive services uh, or services designed to, to slow the progression of chronic diseases, uh, including screenings, um, uh, health promotion, education, prevention of illness, all those different types of things. Um, also, facilitation between uh, beneficiary, beneficiary and a provider. You have uh, language barriers, socioeconomic issues. Uh, and then, as I had mentioned before, uh, transportation issues, which is uh, something that we had uh, was a work group that we'd worked on where community health workers actually came up. We find that a lot of the community health workers today are working with individuals on transportation to and from um, uh, appointments, how to get those set up. They also work on uh, the no-show issue, uh, which are missed appointments, um, calling uh, individuals, reminding them of appointments, helping them schedule appointments on their, uh, making sure that the time when they can come in. Uh, and then if they do miss an appointment without calling, calling them back, getting as much information from them as they can, why they missed the appointment without calling, so, so on and so forth, helping them get set up with a transportation provider if that's what they need. Uh, help them get set up with a, uh, a member of department for uh, 
community-based services and family support. Maybe they need help with child care or some other field or area. Uh, a lot of times we'll find out they'll have two different appointments uh, near the same time on the same day, things like that. And community health workers can help them manage those situations and, and be able to get them uh, the assistance that they need uh, in those arenas. Um, again, navigation, uh, health navigation and resource coordination, they're, they're reaching out to these transportation brokers. They're reaching out to um, uh, different providers, provider types, helping them find a provider in their area, uh, helping them to uh, manage uh, all those different things, uh, you know, helping them get uh, transportation to pharmacies and things like that. Health education and training, making sure that they get the proper immunizations that they need, help them control blood pressure and monitor blood pressure, monitor diabetes, uh, have STD uh, checks if, if needed, uh, things like that. Uh, there's also health promotion and coaching. So uh, they work on the cessation of tobacco use, the reduction of drugs and alcohol, getting them uh, in treatment facilities or centers if that's something that's needed. Um, talking about family planning, control of stress, uh, making sure that they get prenatal uh, care and infancies uh, and, and um, uh, postpartum care, uh, which is what we found in some of the studies that we've we've taken on a lot of uh, uh, the issues that women have uh, with, um, uh, you know, hospitalization during pregnancy is the lack of uh, prenatal care and, and uh, just a lack of education of, of the ability. Uh, and the availability of the, that prenatal care. So, so a lot of different things um, uh, in that arena for CHWs to do. Uh, so uh, a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, we talk about what provider types can build for CHWs. Uh, they are uh, um, alcohol and other drug entities, behavioral health sources, community mental health centers, FQHCs, um, hospitals, local health departments, primary care, rural health, uh, and then, and then other providers uh, that are um, used by Department for uh, Medicaid Services, um, and I'll and I'll 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 show you another screen in a minute that goes over all the providers that are currently billing um, for those services. These are the billing codes for community health workers or CPT codes. There's three of them. Uh, the first CPT code is for one patient. You have a community health worker that's working with an individual patient that's in 30 minute increments. Uh, that is the, the, the rate. And if they're talking to two or two to four patients, it's a different rate and five to eight patients is a different rate. So they're building 30 minute increments. Um, there are limitations. Uh, so uh, you see right there, it says limited to two units per week per member, <clears throat> no more than 104 units per calendar year. Uh, we're kind of de decreasing some of those limitations and increasing, uh, not decreasing, but increasing some of those limit uh, limitations and eliminating some of that other language. Uh, so that's uh, about ready to, to increase um, on the limitation amount. Um, MCOs reimburse for CHWs and they can hire their own CHWs. So there may be CHWs working for the MCOs currently uh, that, uh, that they may have. Um, so that's just kind of a brief overview of what they do. It's a really quick um, synopsis. And as of right now in uh, 2024, uh, we have about 657 claims that have been submitted up to this point. So in the month of January, we had about 657 claims, uh, close to this $47,000 build. Uh, we've had claims from rural health clinics, primary care, FQHCs, We've had claims from physicians, physician groups, hospitals, and APRNs. So um, uh, optometrists are a, a group that is allowed to bill for community health workers. We haven't had any um, uh, claims from the optometry group yet, but um, hopefully we will maybe in the future. Uh, but this is a, uh, we're currently looking at a couple other provider types that we want to include community health workers, and we're working on trying to get those integrated. Uh, but it's a great tool, uh, depending on what your needs are. Uh, if, if you have an office that, that needs an individual um, to meet with someone, go through their care options, their transportation options, um, you know, that, that's something that community health workers do. But they also can to meet meet with someone and go through uh, healthcare prevention or 
uh, you know, in uh, uh, your all's case, they could meet with an individual and and go through, uh, uh, you know, the use of their um, glasses or or contacts and, you know, how to, uh, when to come in and how to clean things and how to work on things, how to wear certain things. And uh, so there's all taught kinds of different uh, functions and, and uses that community health workers have. Uh, but we started that again, January of 2024 and um, some other provider types are using that very successfully. So if you have any other issues or questions or thoughts, um, let me know. Again, I know that was real brief. Um, quick question then, because we're looking at that for managing some of our glaucoma and macular degeneration patients, things like that. Uh, you talked about the certifications. How do they achieve those? So they, they contact the Department for Public Health. They have an office. Uh, uh, they have individuals. And I can, I can get you, I'll get Aaron all that information. She can email all that out to the TAC. Um, they have an office that they uh, uh, do those things. And they have actually, um, um, you know, I think it's a whole branch that does the certifications for community health workers. Uh, they also, I think, do some referrals to, to people can um get a hold of and get in touch with uh, certified community health workers for hire and a contract and things like that. So I'll get you that resource uh, to Aaron. Sure. Have her email that in. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Any other questions? Oh, um, I, I have one. I have, wait, I have one. I'm sorry. I couldn't get off mute nope, fast yep, enough. This yep, is Dr. Yep. Munson. Um, and I may have missed this. Um, is that both in person and virtual that it those is. codes can be paid for? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So it could be virtual, like on a zoom call, it could be a phone call or it could be in person training. That is correct. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. That's one of the things we want to make sure we did. I mean, it's, it's a vital and imperative to be in person. The, the uses is, is amazing. Uh, but one of the things we wanted to make sure that we had all telehealth capabilities, especially for individuals that uh, didn't show up to appointments and didn't call to be able so that they had a way to reach out, contact people, work through those issues um, via telephone and still be able to be reimbursed. All right. uh, if you all have any other questions, anything else, feel free to reach out and um, I'll send Aaron that information, have her get that out to you all. Sounds good. Thank you, Justin. And real quick, before I get off the phone, we are almost completely through with the uh, contact lens um, reimbursement fee schedule. So we'll be sending that to you all um, right before we post it, just for any final thoughts. Uh, but I really appreciate the tax help with uh, with assisting in your all's comments and thoughts with that. It's been a good collaborative work, and I appreciate it. Well, thank you for allowing us to help collaborate. Okay, so that was uh, there under the new business for the community health. I'm going to continue down the, the uh, new business, and then we'll circle back to the old business, if that's okay, since we're there in the new business. Uh, next, uh, the TAC would like to uh, hear a little bit about the non-emergency medical transportation that helps to uh, transport Medicaid recipients to their appointments um, from the uh, department or if the MCOs have any information to share on that topic. Hey, this is Becky Downey. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm with the department for Medicaid services. Um, what kind of questions do you have or what would you like to, what, what do you want to know about? <laughs> Steve, am I mistaken? Is this one that you brought to us? Uh, I don't think so. Other than we heard about it on the Mac, uh, about the community health workers. And I mean, I was not aware of any of these things. Uh, I guess the questions are, how do you use it? Who do you call? Um, um, there's a list that we have. Um, the entire state is broken down into regions. There are 16 regions. And <clears throat> each region has 
anywhere from one county up to, you know, six, seven, eight counties, depending on their sizes and the need in each county. Um, I can send Aaron the list and it tells you all the counties and who the broker is, which is who they would call. And then, of course, the broker's phone numbers. And there's an email address, too, but we suggest calling. But that's well, the that best. Would, Go ahead. I'm, I'm going to say that that would be for the Medicaid recipient to call to set it up. Yes. Okay. Yes, if, if, can, if, can providers call? Um, I do not think so because okay. um, our transportation broker looks at each member that needs transportation to make sure they're eligible. Sure, sure. Yeah, because there's, just... there's a few issues about, you know, if they have a, a vehicle in the house and if it's in their name and is it operable or inoperable. And so there's a few things that they have to check for eligibility. So, no, I am 99% sure providers cannot do that. Well, and, and maybe not us as called to facilitate, but I do know I have patients in my McKee office that don't have phones. So is there oh. ways that, that, you know, we could call and let the person from talk from uh, the patient talk from our office to them to arrange different yes. transportations? Yes, you can do that. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking, cause I know there's several that, that don't have uh, phones for sure. Gotcha. Yeah, no, you can yeah. do that. Not a problem. I guess the email might work for them, but I don't know if they have email either. So. Right. Understood. But it, it, it seems to, I, I myself, I do worry about email <laughs> getting answered as quickly as, you know, they might need it. So that's right, why I right. always tell everyone to call. Sure. Sure. And that would be for, um, non-emergency transportation. Like, you know, I'm, I'm assuming what we mean by that is that they're coming for their yearly exam, things like that. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And this Anybody is, this is Justin Derringer again. I just want to reiterate that non-emergency transportation is for everything that's not ambulance related. So uh, any kind of, uh, you know, visit that, that they would need for your all's offices, would they would be available for, for transportation through NEMT or non-emergency okay. And so then referrals from our office to a, a specialist, say they were having um, a retinal detachment and they needed to go immediately from our office, that would be uh, emergency transport, right? Well, yeah, as long as they were going, you know, by ambulance, that would be, you know, if you had an ambulance coming and picking them up and taking them, that would be, you know. Well, typically, situation. typically we don't send them by ambulance for that, but that would be whoever brought them typically takes them. Yeah, so so in that case, they could absolutely use an EMT if it's not if it's not an emergency situation that they need transportation to a hospital. They're just going to another provider that you've uh, referred them to. Um, then they could use an EMT for that. Even same day. Sure. Okay. Now there are certain rules that the transportation has set up. They they ask for so many hour notice and all those type things, um, but. Right. Uh, you know, they can set up whatever they need to set up. Um, and, and sometimes they're, you know, pretty good to work with if there's certain things that pop up through during the day. Sure. Any other questions from the TAC? Okay. Well, moving on to the next one there. Um, Steve, I'm going to let you uh, jump in on discussing uh, the recommendation from Dr. Gupta. Uh, Dr. Gupta is an ophthalmologist by training, but she represents Physicians TAC. And at the November meeting, um, they submitted a formal recommendation asking uh, DMS to do a cost study on what it would cost to get... Um, Physicians' fees tied to the Medicare rate. North Carolina apparently does this. And I'm paraphrasing. It's been three months since the meeting. Uh, but in my 
the two things that concern me is one, we want to be included. And I think a recommendation said physicians and we're defined as physicians under DMS, as I understand it. But she also, I looked up the minutes a minute ago, she also included uh, uh, obstetricians, gynecologists also be included as primary care. So I just want to make, if those fees are adjusted, I want to make sure we're included. The other thing, she read a list of CPT codes to be um, uh, researched. And I don't think the 92,000 ophthalmological codes were in her list. And I, I, I suppose we should make a recommendation that those be added, that we'd be included and they be added, or, or maybe that's something that administratively can be taken care of. But um, the, the 99,000 codes were included and she had a, had a big range, but I don't recall her um, including the 92,000 ophthalmology codes. So I just, I just want to make sure we're not getting left out. So I would ask the, um, the department if, is that something that can be just added uh, to look at if that moves forward or do we, need to make the formal request to add the 92,000 codes. The department has responded to that recommendation, but I don't have that in front of me. So I can't, I did forward it to the KOA office, I think. Is there anybody on here from DMS can respond to that? My apologies, Dr. Compton. I was trying to pull up um, okay. the the response from DMS. My apologies. And then I couldn't find my mute button. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Too many screens, too many things open. My apologies. Uh, the response... <clears throat> excuse me, states that DMS will prepare a cost estimate. Please note that the budget process will determine if additional funds are allocated to the physician's fee schedule. The budget process will be determined during the 2024 Kentucky legislative session. Also, any changes to the physician's fee schedule would be app applicable to fee-for-service only and providers would have to negotiate rates with the, the managed care organizations. I suppose it's wait and see, but the, the question is, are we included and are, are the uh, ophthalmology co codes included? Do we need to make a formal recommendation to add that or is that part of the process already? Uh, what I could do, Dr. Compton, if you'd like, uh, this is Aaron, is I can follow up with Justin and the policy group to see what was included in that recommendation. Um, to be honest, that's a little outside of my wheelhouse, so I'd have to follow up with the, the subject experts, but I will put that okay. on our follow-up list and right. get that information to okay. you right away. Thank you. I think that would be the easiest route. Um, now we'll just go from there. Thank you. You're welcome. Sounds good. Sounds good. Any other uh, questions from the TAC on that particular? Okay. Good deal. Let's move <clears throat> back up to old business. And uh, once again, for DMS, is there uh, any update on communicating with the uh, board of examiners on uh, them sending the license renewals to you all? This is Jennifer Dudinsky with um, Program Integrity. I have great news. We have finally received the file <laughs> after all these months. I'm very happy to report we have received the first file on January 25th. So we are in the process of looking at that, matching it up. Um, and so we have 
it seems like we have a good contact now. Um, she did state that there, there will be another update soon because of the, I guess, the expiration date on the file that they sent to us. So uh, we will remain in contact with them and hopefully we will have this up and going very soon. Good, good. We'll, um, we'll probably, I guess, circle back at the next TAC meeting to see where it stands again, but thanks for the, uh, the good update. That's encouraging news. You're welcome. Once again, any other questions from TAC on that point? Okay. Um, so, Dr. Compton, I'll go back to you. Um, wait, wait, I'm sorry. My mute button. It's just going to be the day <laughs> my existence today. Um, so, does that, this is a question for Jennifer, does that mean that as of now, our providers still need to do status quo where they need to upload their license wow. to the mm -hmm. portal and like certify or whatever? We have to go in there to verify that it is our license, it is us. Um, until further notice, because I thought that was the goal was that we didn't have to do that anymore. Right, but we just received the file on the 25th. So we haven't had time to make sure that there's a seamless transition there. So we got their file. We have to enter that into our system. Um, but yes, that is the goal. Hopefully we will be there very soon. We've made a huge stride in getting the data. So that that is the goal. And I will be happy to give you all an update at your next meeting on where we are with that. But just to just to confirm that we need to make sure that every Medicaid provider is still doing what they had in the past, uploading their license and verifying it within the um, state website. Yes. Nobody should be just doing nothing and thinking it's handled. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Just I want to make sure we give everybody direct orders. So the hope is that maybe when we're when it comes around next year, we'll have this kind of process done and then maybe next year it'll just magically get uploaded is that correct well that is the goal yes okay good thank you okay are you satisfied dr munson <laughs> yes yes <laughs> okay good deal Good deal. Okay. So um, moving on now, back to you, Steve. Uh, yeah, this was on the last TAC agenda as well. Um, and I think it was just with the visas. Is this the only... We have, we'll have a patient coming in and we'll check the DMS portal and the visas portal and it, you know, it's middle of the month, 15th, 16th, and they both say the patient's eligible and we see the patient build the... Build the uh, Managed care well, build the subcontractor for the MCO. We get our money, and then sometime later, we get a letter saying, Oh, the patient wasn't eligible on the date of service. We're going to recoup the money. And then we write a letter, include all, we make screenshots of everything we check and send it in. And so far, I don't think they've taken any money back, but there's some, there's some out there that we haven't heard back from. But I don't, I don't know what the hiccup is that if all the portals that we check say they're eligible, this is not like on the first day of the month. We know that's not always up to date. And then it's just, it's a huge administrative task. Plus, you're kind of at risk. They could take back any money, any time. You know, if we, if we do it wrong, we just have to live with it, but. So after last month, we got an a email telling us how to enroll our our uh, clients, but I, I, that's that's not what I was talking about. If if all the portals say they're eligible and we see the patient on the date that they're eligible, there shouldn't be any question about recruit recruitment of fees. Hello, Dr. Compton. This is Nicole with Avesis. Thank Hi, you for um, for your feedback. Hi there. Um, unfortunately, the the portals are not a guarantee of eligibility. Um, as you know, um, Medicaid throughout the United States, throughout the country, is going through a revalidation process. So right now we're having more um, activity with eligibility than we've seen in years. 
Um, and and as a, as Avisas is making outreach, the MCOs are making a, a number of different outreaches um, to the members. Your offices are also telling members if they're um, up for revalidation and DMS is telling the members if they're up for revalidation. If the member does not um, revalidate timely, um, but then does so at a later date, you will see some uh, um, activity on their eligibility status. Um, uh, the When the member does update the eligibility information, um, their eligibility is reinstated without activity. But unfortunately, you're 100% you're correct. That can impact um, claims processing. Um, and, and that's across the board. Um, so, you know, if that patient received an inpatient service within the that service period, or if they received, you know, whatever, so if they went to a medical doctor within that period, unfortunately, um, um, that's a possibility. Um, but it happens in commercial, it happens, you know, in, in all lines of business um, um, that we operate in. But um, the processing of the eligibility files um, by a visas um, is, um, is completed um, uh, within a certain amount of uh, hours that we receive it from the MCOs and they process it daily from DMS. And once a month, we process a monthly full file. So we process daily files and monthly full files. If there ever is a scenario where you saw the patient, um, both of uh, uh, the, the MMIS and the visa system state that the member is active, there is retroactivity or there's a, a termination that, that occurs um, after the claim is processed. Um, you have the appeal process you can do. Um, you can also um, reach out to a visa's customer service team or provider relations and share with them the scenario. And we do have an eligibility team that is uh, dedicated to uh, verifying the eligibility status of the member on MMIS or on, on a DMS system. So they will actually go into DMS system. And if there is a uh, discrepancy where DMS says they're active, a visa says they're not, and that may just be to the the uh, timing of the files being processed, we'll go up and we update um, a visa system to match DMS, um, and then that will um, uh, that will trigger the system to um, to to adjudicate or re-adjudicate that claim. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go through the appeal process, you know, to provide the copies and do the research and your time to spend your staff to spend the administrative time to do that. Um, the, we could handle that, or we can handle that through through a call um, into our customer service team. But we'll have one of the PR reps um, reach out to you. Um, and I apologize, I can see your office manager's face, so your biller's face. But I can't think of her name. And I apologize for that, but we'll um, we can reach out to her um, and, and share those contact numbers with her uh, so that she knows how to go through that process as opposed sure. to doing the appeal. Okay, thank you. Her name is Cindy, and she's actually sitting. Cindy, in the yes. Sir, I can put the camera on her if you want to see her face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just it's, it's you know it's like I don't know. It just seems. This this connect, there's a disconnect there. If everything says they're this is like the middle of the month, everything says says they're eligible. Yeah, but that's no guarantee of payment. It's like why bother? You know? Yeah, yeah, yes, I understand. I understand, and I know um, when I first entered into the market. Um, it was something that happened more frequently. Um, then it, it it happened very infrequently. So the Kentucky market is not, um, you know, you. It's, you guys aren't used to this. Other markets, we, we get this a lot on, on the Medicaid line of business. But again, I think it's primarily due to the uh, uh, to the revalidation process. Um, DMS has been wonderful with, you know, granting extensions. The federal government has been wonderful with granting extensions um, to help mem or to give members more time um, to to revalidate. But unfortunately, if they don't, um, they are, they um, they do lose eligibility until until they complete the process. That's all I had, Matt. Okay. Any uh, other questions on that topic for many of y'all? Okay. Well. Let me make my list to make sure I didn't skip anything. I don't think I have. 
I do have um, a general discussion topic, um, mainly for the department. So um, I'll throw it out there. If, or let's go back, all the codes that are listed on the vision fee schedule, uh, the the MCOs and or the, um, the vision providers are required to pay those codes, correct? I apologize, Dr. Brichette. Was that question for DMS? Um, uh, initially, yes. Okay. I'm trying to scroll to see who might be able to address that. I'm not seeing, <clears throat> looks like Justin had to drop. I can take that back. Um, because I do not sure, want well, to speak incorrectly. <laughs> no, and I don't want you all to either. I'm, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to, to, to kind of clear the air. So I'll go on with my, uh, my thought, my stream of thought here. Um, it was my understanding that, that they did, as long as there weren't any, um, you know, frequency limitations uh, that have been met and or, um, they have a prior authorization process that we have to go through for some kind of testing code, like a visual field or an OCT or something like that. Um, it was my, my understanding that, that if there weren't anything in place like that, um, like they had a, a maybe a, an LCD that lists, you know, these diagnoses are appropriate for that particular code or test, things like that. But if those things weren't in place, then the code was there, then uh, they should pay it without any hassles. Uh, my, my thought on that is we've got an awful lot of uh, backup on what on our end seem to be clean claims that when we try to contact people uh, and send them back in, they are clean claims that have been denied for one reason or another. Um, not sure exactly why I'd have to pull my billing people, but I do know that we have a, a huge stack of claims. Not all of them are clean, for sure. We make our mistakes. And I know a visas I uh, was in recently, I think it was Catherine. And I'm, am I missing the name? But was in helping us uh, go through some of our claims from a visas recently, and we appreciate that. Um, but past that, if we continue to have issues of, of clean claims uh, getting denied and or um, things that, that we appeal that get denied from the MCOs, what is our recourse through the department uh, to have the department step in and look at it? Is it, is it going to be the new MCO dispute form that the MAC had, uh, I think it was last time put out? Yes, sir. This is Aaron. I can, I can answer that one. Uh, yes. So, so anytime um, a provider is having some issues with any of the MCOs or their subcontractors, we encourage the provider to fill out that dispute form and email it in. I believe there's also an Excel sheet, and I'm happy to share this with the TAC after the meeting um, for examples and claims. And then DMS can um, kind of step in and and try to help facilitate. Um, a resolution. And so we're, we're really trying to, I know they put a lot of work into revamping that form to make it more user-friendly for the providers. So we're, high, we're um, really trying to encourage all providers having any kind of issues to, to go through that route because it is also monitored and tracked for uh, trending issues. Okay. So I just wanted to, uh, and I don't, like I said, I don't have any super specific examples. I just know it's been brought to my attention um, what's that process? So I just wanted to clear up what that was so that we could put it out to, uh, 
to our optometrist across the state if they are having issues that they can't seem to get resolved where they where they can go to maybe get some relief of that. So that that would be all I had on that issue unless one of the other TAC members had any thoughts to that and or have other issues they'd like to talk about. No takers? Gary, you've been awful quiet this meeting. You're still on mute, buddy. Been a long morning. <laughs> Sorry, I got on late. <laughs> That's fine. I just making sure you weren't asleep. Nope. I'm here. Good deal. Okay. Um, that's all I had on, on that topic. So Aaron, if you could send um, that along to, to us so we could make that available to information available to people, that would be great. Absolutely. And then um, that's all I have, unless somebody else has another item that is pressing that they thought of in the last two or three days. Nothing? No? Okay. Well, if that's the case, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I make the motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good deal. Our next, our next meeting before we get off, uh, what, May 2nd? Does that sound familiar to everybody? Yes. Just to make sure? Yep. Okay. Well, like I said, that's all I've got. Y'all have a good afternoon. Appreciate Thank you all you. coming. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.